All right. Thank you so much. And uh, again, to, to colleagues that are joining us from uh, uh, all the different countries, different institutions, uh, I would like to start by welcoming you, welcoming you all to to this conversation that we'd like to have about uh, about El Nino, uh, and and I think uh, you you'll agree with me that uh, if you live maybe on the eastern coast of Africa or in the southern part of the continent, this is probably one of the most topical issues that everyone is discussing uh, at the moment, and and the reason why this is so is because. Uh, uh, El Nino is like that uh, friend or cousin that uh, visits you, and uh, depending on which part of the world you are in, uh, El Nino brings uh, good presents or good tidings, or in, in some other areas, uh, El Nino is a bad omen. And I think it's important for us, therefore, to, to really understand uh, what El Nino actually brings for us. Uh, as a, as a, as a, especially in the East and Southern African context. And I think for us to be able to do that, we thought it would be good to, to get a few experts uh, around the table. Uh, so you'll notice that we've got, um, you know, two very uh, important uh, colleagues. Uh, we've got our colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Tafad Zwanashe uh, Mabaudi, who is actually the research group leader at the International Water Management Institute, uh, responsible for sustainable and resilient food systems. Uh, he's an expert in his field, and I think he's going to give us from a scientific perspective what it is that we can expect uh, on uh, as since we are facing an El Nino year, and in many areas, we're actually in the middle of it. But I think uh, what's also important is to understand how do we get the correct messages to the people that need to get them. And uh, for that, we've invited onto, onto this panel an esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Isaiah Bendy. Uh, he's the CEO and president of Trico Incorporated, uh, which is a, a, a technology firm uh, with operations in a number of continents. Uh, but with a strong focus on trying to be part of the solution in uh, in in improving access to information for 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 African farmers uh, uh, across our continent. So, without much further further ado, uh, I would like us to 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 get started and to really maybe get started by making a point about why are we here. And, and the reason why we are here is to really help us to, to increase our understanding of this El Nino uh, phenom phenomenon and the impact that it's likely going to have on smallholder farming systems, particularly um, in the Eastern and Southern part of the continent. And I think to, to say that because they say in many languages on the African continent, there are proverbs that talk about information being power and that he that gives you information is the person that uh, is 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 saving is saving you or saving your day, and therefore we want to discuss what are those practical strategies that people can employ uh, to respond to the current challenge that we are facing with the with El Nino, and the practical things that you can do at a farm level, uh, and how these particular you know interventions could could potentially improve things for you. And also to make sure that we are creating a rallying call for different types of partnerships to come around the table so that we can really reverse the potential negative impacts that we might get uh, from, uh, from El Nino. And to kick us off, I'm, I'm going to turn to, to my brother, uh, Tafadzwa, and ask that uh, maybe Tafadzwa, could you, you know, give us some insight? Uh, from a from a scientific perspective, from a climate perspective, from a, a, an agricultural perspective, what is El Nino? Over to you, Tafadzo. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Mandla, and a uh, good day to uh, colleagues uh, joining us on this call. I think, uh, as you've mentioned, people talk a lot about El Nino, and El Nino is, you know, one of two uh, weather systems. We've got El Nino and La Nina. And these are natural weather systems uh, that occur uh, in the Pacific. In particular, they, they break the normal pattern of trade winds moving 
uh, in the Pacific at this time. And in particular for El Nino, what it represents is a warming of uh, you know, air above the you know, ocean surface in that region. What it brings to us, especially in Southern Africa, the weather pattern is that it's often associated with above average temperatures. So it, it gets warmer than usual. Uh, it's uh, associated with below average rainfall and drought. So you've got dryness, dry conditions. Mm -hmm. And when you combine the, the high temperatures and the dry conditions, it creates you know, uh, an environment that is conducive for wildfires. So you also have issues of wildfires uh, associated with El Nino. Uh, it, it disrupts our normal cropping season and cropping pattern because of the below average rainfall that we would receive then at that uh, particular moment. So in, in Southern Africa in particular, when we think El Nino, people often think about drought, that there's going to be a drought, there's going to be crop failure, there's going to be a hunger, uh, but it's also important to understand that, you know, no two El Nino events uh, are the same as is weather always. So like this year in particular, we've been talking about El Nino since the beginning of the year. Uh, people initially were forecasting a super El Nino. Uh, so far now we're talking about the, you know, impacts being more felt in the second half of the season. I had people asking me why we are experiencing a lot of rainfall in October when it should be El Nino. So not two El Ninos are, are the same and how the, the, the system evolves uh, again and impacts our weather system. Uh, it's, it's also affected by other systems that are happening uh, globally uh, you know, over the oceans. But the important takeaway home is it is a natural weather system. The aspect where climate change comes in is that because of the natural warming or because of the human induced warming uh, caused by climate change, it then intensifies the effect of this natural system. So where it was already going to be hot, it's, it gets hotter. Where we're going to experience dryness, it gets drier. So climate change then intensifies uh, those you know, effects that El Nino would have naturally had. I think that, that that's very interesting for, for me, Tafadza. I think there, there are a few things that stood out when you were describing this. First of all, are you saying to us that um, uh, something that's happening in the Pacific, many of us have never even been close to the Pacific, Something that's actually happening in the Pacific is impacting how the rain and weather patterns in our region are actually going to to play. I mean, are we that are we that vulnerable, or is is this something totally new, where something happening in the Pacific is affecting our weather systems, or is this something that happens all the time? This is something that happens all the time, and and has been happening. Uh, since forever. So it's a, it's a natural weather system. Um, under normal conditions, it's the weather system emanating from there and how the winds blow into the Americas, Asia, and onto the African continent. That also influences uh, our weather systems. Where El Nino and La Nina come in is they disrupt this natural weather system that is okay. always happening and being generated from those areas and they impact it differently with El Nino in Southern Africa, meaning higher temperatures and you know, below average rainfall. In other parts, El Nino brings with it you know, higher above average rainfall. So it's, it's experienced differently in different geographies. In our particular geography, we, you know, we look for, or we experience drier conditions, drier than average conditions. That's, that's very interesting because I'm, uh, I'm joining this webinar from uh, Nairobi and uh, here in Kenya, we are having uh, floods in countries like, um, you know, in the region here in countries like Somalia, uh, we are hearing of floods, um, you know, in, uh, in the neighboring countries to Kenya and Nairobi itself, you know, has been having heavy rains for, for quite a while. 
So, so you're absolutely right that the El Nino experience that I'm having sitting in Nairobi is totally different from maybe what uh, people are experiencing in, in, in Southern Africa. I, I, I guess with all the information that we have, first of all, you said we knew the El Nino was coming much early this year. Initially, we thought it would be a super El Nino. Uh, now we think that it will maybe affect the second half of the season. What can farmers do with this information? What, what, what would you recommend farmers to do with this information, Tapajo? Okay, that's, that's a very good question, Mandela. So, you know, information uh, has to convert to knowledge. So we start off with data, which is what the global circulation models give us. The interpretation of the data is the information that says there's an upcoming El Nino. Now we, we need to be able to then convert the information into knowledge, which is an aspect of dissemination. How do we disseminate it to the farmers uh, using appropriate formats, tools, and languages that the farmers can then you know, apply the knowledge. When we get to that point where farmers now know that you know, there is El Nino and what El Nino means for them, I always give an example that if, if I say it's going to rain, I must contextualize it to say it is going to rain in Nairobi and we expect that we will have, you know, afternoon to late afternoon thunderstorms that will affect, you know, the eastern part of Nairobi. Then you know that if you're in the eastern yep. part of Nairobi in the afternoon to late afternoon, there will be a thunderstorm and you need to have an umbrella or you need to be indoors at that time or you yep. need to be where you needed to be. So it's the same level of detail that we have to give to farmers. Uh, in terms of what they can do, they can prepare for a dry season. Uh, that entails from variety selection that yep. you need to select crop varieties that are drought tolerant. Uh, you need to select crop varieties that are going to mature early because as we are seeing now, we expect that the, you know, the effects of El Nino will be felt more strongly in the second half of the season. So if you are planting early and you've got early maturing varieties, you might be able to escape you know, the, the hard times or those effects become fully uh, expressed. Uh, beyond appropriate variety selection, there is things such as planting dead selection, so they need to be planting early, taking advantage of the residual soil moisture, which in many areas is still very high and has also benefited from some of the rains that we've had during spring, which were higher than average. Uh, farmers should have already, in areas that are prone to wildfires, they should have already burnt fire breaks during the, the fire burning season, because the risk of fire is very high during uh, El Nino, if you have got dry vegetation, strong winds and high temperatures. So they should have already burned fire breaks to control and manage the risk of fire. They need to practice, you know, in-field uh, rainwater harvesting and soil water conservation, uh, such as, you know, planting on ridges, using furrows, pot hauling, uh, you know, the, the whole basket of conservation agriculture practices mm. that are geared towards conserving and maximizing water in the field, where the infrastructure is available for irrigation, they should prepare uh, for supplemental irrigation so that during the dry spells or the dry periods, they can, you know, provide supplementary irrigation to their crops. In certain areas, it might mean, uh, you know, mixing the crop mix so that if you know that you, you, have, you know, like we know maize is, is very sensitive to, to drought. It's also very sensitive to high temperatures, especially if they occur and coincide with the critical uh, reproductive stages. So de-risking those maize-based systems through diversification, with other more drought tolerant crops such as your legumes and so forth. So there's, there's a whole raft of measures that are available for, for farmers to be able to deploy. But again, I must emphasize that all of these measures have to be regionally uh, differentiated and contextualized because the impacts 
will be felt differently. Even within the same country, the impacts yeah. will be felt differently across different regions of the country. So farmers, depending on where they are, they would have to then choose the appropriate combination of techniques to deploy uh, for where they are. I, I mean, what, what I think uh, I like about uh, your response, Tafadza, is that uh, you're saying, yes, this thing that's happening thousands of kilometers away on the Pacific is going to affect uh, how we, we should do agriculture. But what I'm hearing from you is that we actually have options. There are things that we can do uh, which are practical uh, at a farmer level. And I think that gives me a lot of hope. But you and I know that, uh, you know, for information like this, which sits in, uh, in uh, you know, great scientists like you, for it to get to farmers and to get uh, to farmers in the, in the format uh, that they can do something with is, is not an easy business. What are you as, uh, you know, the science community perhaps doing to make sure that th this, these advisories or this content is, is available for people to be able to take and do something uh, with, with it? What, 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 what are you as a science community working on? I think as a, as a science community, we, we have been improving in the recent past. And part of that improvement is us acknowledging that as scientists, we are not the best communicators in town. So uh, we have partnered in many ways with different uh, organizations that have better communication skills. And we are sharing the information. Uh, we are putting it in the media a lot. We have published, you know, briefing notes way ahead uh, of the El Nino. We have published advisories and disseminated them uh, way ahead of the El Nino. We have engaged with various media entities, again, way ahead of the El Nino to, to build awareness. So a lot of this has been to build awareness and that has worked because look, we are here having this conversation. Yeah. So yeah. it means the awareness raising has worked. Uh, we've also worked on, you know, developing decision support systems uh, and providing agro advisory for farmers on the ground so that we provide information that is actionable for farmers on the ground. Uh, so there's been a lot of work in terms of developing decision support systems and agro advisory tools and capacitating, you know, public and private sector extension officers so that they are able to use this information and also transfer it to farmers on the ground. We've also disseminated directly to farmers on the ground. As soon as we knew that there was El Nino coming, we've ensured that that information has been moving on the ground to farmers because farmers already started preparing for the season around June, July, they were buying seeds, uh, yeah. they were buying fertilizers, uh, they were starting to clear their land, preparing for the season. So things such as variety selection, the decision would have already been made then. Uh, things yeah. such as planting dead selection, the decision would have been made then to inform when you do land preparation uh, in, you know, in anticipation of planting. So we've really been amping up uh, our dissemination uh, and developing different tools with different formats and also bundling the knowledge. Uh, in, yeah. in older days, as, as scientists we were fragmented, so the climate scientists would say one thing, make an announcement. The agronomists would have an agronomic intervention, uh, the soil scientists and so forth. But now I think through initiatives such as excellence in agronomy, we are better able to synthesize and integrate knowledge across disciplines and bundle that into you know one product or one offering that we then deliver to the farmer which allows the farmer to make the sort of decisions that they need to make more holistically than in in drips and drabs 100 percent. i mean i think i think that that's really brilliant and i think it allows me to segue uh, across to to my brother isaiah bendy uh, who who works in the field of uh, you know information technology? Isaiah, we live in a time where you know we are even uh, having AI, uh, you know, writing uh, papers for us. Uh, we are having AI doing compositions and uh, 
and articles on our behalf. For you guys as the as the information technology sector, uh, what role do you see for yourselves uh, in this um, in this conundrum? Right, uh, Tafadzo and the colleagues they've uh, they've gone and looked at uh, at what the science is saying. They've packaged it into messages, but like Tafadzo says, scientists are probably not the best people to communicate this message. How do we make sure using technology? that farmers actually access this information at the right time with the right content and uh, in a format and manner that they can do something about it. Tell us a little bit about what your organization does and what you think the the, the tech sector can contribute to this. Thank you very much, uh, Mandla, um, and thanks for the opportunity to speak here. Also, thanks to Prof. Um, I think um, uh, you've given me so much notes today. Um, just a bit of my organization. Um, yes, um, I run a technology company, which we founded uh, over a decade ago. Um, but the focus of our work has been on the what we call low and middle income community, um, using technology to basically empower this community who we believe um, are the primary or should be the primary target of every information and every impact that is um, available in the technology um, world. Um, the world is advancing. We shouldn't leave these people behind. So our work over the past 10 years has been focused on empowering these people using technology uh, in the area of distribution, um, either consumer um, distribution. Um, and most importantly, the one we're excited about is in areas of education. Um, and I think uh, you, Mandela, you, um, you know, one of the things you mentioned during your opening is the fact that information is power. Um, but most importantly, like you rightly outlined, the practical thing that can be done, right, with that information is the most important thing. Um, so for us um, at FBIs, um, which is the group, um, um, a company that founded, later on founded Trico, where today I sit as the president and the CEO. Um, so for us, how we convey, uh, and I think Prof really, really um, spoke um, well on that, how we convey that, right, um, that knowledge, that information that has become um, um, a knowledge, and obviously knowledge is what will save us or uh, would help us avoid disaster, right? Uh, without an information, there is no um, room for avoidance. Um, disaster is inevitable. Now, one thing that... Um, we pride ourselves, well, I would say the focus of our work is um, using technology is we use the data that is available to us. So especially in Africa, um, I know that we're having a question about the Southern Africa today, but when we look at our population in Africa today, there is a data that is of a great concern. Um, the first data is that the Sub-Saharan population, of course, we know we're over 1, point, um, um, 1 billion um, in terms of population. But the scariest thing about our population is that we have, um, as I turn to into the data published by World Bank, states that we have less than 36% of our population that are internet enabled. And wow. the most scariest part of that data is that we have just about 130 million, I can speak English. So this information, this knowledge that Prof, you know, um, and his esteemed colleagues have you know, um, invested a lot of research into developing and all of that. This data prevents us with a very, very huge barrier of dissemination, okay? Um, in terms of preparing these people, the, the people in the low and middle income society uh, or community, you know, um, in terms of access to this information. And when we're talking about El Nino, who are the first people that are likely to be impacted by El Nino? Like Prof said, these are natural occurrence they are inevitable, they would definitely happen. But the people that this could impact the most, you know, um, are we sure that the tools that we apply right now, um, you know, is able to disseminate the information to them? And that's where we come in, right? Um, yep. Today, if we look at data in Africa, for example, using technology. So technology is here to simplify all the processes that we have in place, but let's not forget um, the people that the data that I mentioned earlier, we just have less than 30% or less than 40% of our population. And this 40% that we have that are internet enabled, that the people at the top of the pyramid, not the people at the bottom of the pyramid. So that presents us with a problem of how we disseminate this information. So 
we need to start looking at what are the tools that are available. So uh, forgive me to go into the financial sector, for example, in Africa. Um, great data or permit me to use Kenya as well as a use case where we see the impact of use of the likes of technology around and also on, 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 on structured short code, which is USSD, right? We've seen the impact that I've have on in terms of inclusion when we're talking about financial inclusion. Yeah. Um, and the, the data across Africa is just, is just massive, right? How that has helped us deepen reach to the rural areas in terms of financial inclusion. Now, data or information or knowledge um, that we have today about El Nino, it's about time we start adopting those technology. And that's what right. our work has been about, right? Uh, because these farmers um, today in Africa, we have, we have over 500, over half a billion Africans that are connected right, in terms of mobile Sorry. device. Mm -hmm. So even Correct. though they, do, they can't afford the smart device, they are connected on mobile device. So it's about yeah. time we start taking the interactive voice response technology, the FMS technology, the, 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 the USSD technology to enable these farmers. But most importantly, we have to localize this content. And I think Prof touched on that when he spoke about, um, you know, um, the contents or I would say the, 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 it varies according to regions, right? So when we are disseminating this information, we have to make it very, very dynamic um, in terms of considering the, lo uh, the, the, the location or the society, uh, I mean, rather, the community that we're trying to disseminate this information. So what stops us from disseminating this information in Swahili? What stops us from disseminating this in Yoruba? What's a, so just consider the environment because the majority of our society or the people that El Nino could have a great impact on are people that do not have access to the sophisticated English that you and I speak, the device, the internet, and all of that. So I think um, I would say that's where the work of technology comes in. Right. In focus, adopting the um, the bottom of the pyramid technology, which is the likes of USSD, SMS, and IVR, you know, basically to reach out to these farmers with this um, knowledge of El Nino. And, and and I mean that's really helpful. I mean, uh, uh, it, I get the sense from your response that you're saying to us that look, we actually now have the tools that can allow this information to get to every farmer. If they've got a a feature phone, a smartphone, uh, they are listening to radio or whatever. Mm -hmm. We actually now have the technologies that allow us to get the messages close to farmers. But you're saying that. Let's not just focus on the technology which exists, yeah. but yeah. how the content is yeah. made fit for purpose, not only for that particular technology, but yeah. for the people that are listening at the other end. Now, exactly. do you have examples, for example, in, in the work that you are doing, where you've been able to disseminate complicated content to large numbers of farmers? And can you share that experience and some of the impact that you've seen? in localizing, yes. in leveraging technology so that the audience out there can understand that, yes, we are facing this big monster called El Nino. Tafazo, yes. I said, look, we've got all the information. You are saying maybe there's a vehicle that can take the information to the side of the farmer's field. Right. Thank you, um, Mandela. So, I mean, the, one of the data, um, you know, that, that is in, was interesting to us and that's what led to developing the platforms that um, I'm going to speak about um, in a moment um, is the data where we, we only had about just one out of six Africans that are actively um, internet enabled, right? So that led us to building what we call BIM City, which is a platform as a service for um, education. So BIM City is basically targeted at um, people at the lower ends of the pyramid, people who cannot afford to pay for internet subscription, who cannot afford to solve the internet, who do not even have the knowledge of how to solve the internet to start with. So what we do with BIM City is BIM City is driven on USSD and SMS and IVR. So what we've been able to do with that is that we've been able to create a complete curriculum Right. That so take for example um, the information or the knowledge of um, uh, um, El Nino that we want to communicate to the farmers. So what we've done in Nigeria, for example, we built a complete what we call um, the farmers business school. Right. Um, so you and I can afford to come on our on our sophisticated design, um, our devices rather to take to take um, different um, classes or to solve the internet for information and all of that. So we set out and said 
what stops us from enabling these guys at the lower end of the pyramid? The main people, these guys are the ones that they are the actual farmers. So one thing that we don't pay attention is that when we use the word smallholder farmers, the smallholder farmers are not the sophisticated farmers, right? So what we've done is we translate the content, right? Um, the, the cost content. So for example, best practice in um, and, and, and rice farming. So we translated that content to all the five major languages in Nigeria. Uh, we translated to Yoruba, um, English, Hausa, um, Igbo, um, and, and, and Pidgin English. We've translated this entire faculty to this. Now, the interesting data that we found out there is that we discovered that most of our farmers that subscribe to this farmer's business school are subscribing to the local languages, right? And out of curiosity, when we dived into those data, tried to engage some of those farmers, well, one thing we discovered is that they relate better with the information when it's being yeah communicated yeah. in their local dialect they can pick absolutely choice. so absolutely. it's not everybody that can learn using words right um theory some people are visual learners so if they're able to visualize what you're talking about then they're able to apply it so that's the reason why most of them will subscribe to the local language so we've been able yeah. to build that and we, we, we're beginning to see the impact we begin to see the pickup because we've cut off that barrier of sophisticated content going on the internet. We've cut off that barrier of needing to read it out in English or whatever. And this content is delivered to them is all in audio, right? So they can dial in using voice and follow the, 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 the voice prompts to you know, take the desired content that they want to listen to and learn in their local dialect. And that is driving the engagement and the impact. Fantastic. I mean, I think, I think for me, this is music to my ear because one of the things I always worry about is that uh, you know, uh, you guys in the technology space, you get very excited about the technology and forget that it actually needs to have an impact in a real person. So really excited to hear that there is practical ways in which we can really use technology on the dissemination side. Uh, to the audience out there, we're about to open uh, the session up for, for questions. But while you are preparing your questions, you can type them either in the chat uh, or in the question and answer button at the bottom of your screens. While we're preparing for that, I just want to shift quickly back to, to Tafadzwa and, uh, and try and uh, understand. So you say that you have already packaged a lot of information and content. So to, to my grandmother, you know, in the middle of uh, Southern Zimbabwe in Matebeleland, or to a farmer sitting in uh, in Chimoyo or Tet in Mozambique, uh, how how are you guys making this content readily understandable uh, by by this uh, this type of farmers? Is is there is there help that you need? Is there support that you need to to break this content down down? Or you've already done that already? I think help is always appreciated. Uh, as, as Isaiah said, there is a need to translate this information into local languages uh, so that it, it becomes relevant for the farmers on the ground. So I'll, I'll give an example in South Africa where I am. We've got 12 official languages. Uh, yeah. we, would, we would have given out the advisory in English. It needs to be translated into the 12 official languages of the country for farmers sitting in different areas to understand it. Equally, we would have issued out an advisory for Zimbabwe. Uh, and we did issue one particularly for the Limpopo uh, Basin, which would be where yeah. your, your mother is sitting uh, in yeah. Matebele South. That yeah. advisory needs to be translated into Sindebele. Uh, beyond translating it into Sindebele, we we need to further contextualize it into Gwai, if she mm. is in Gwai or Gwanda, mm. and say, in particular, if you are in Gwai, this is what it means to you for the crops that you produce in mm. Gwai. Maybe you are planting sorghum, you are planting millets. This this is what it means to you. These are the varieties of sorghum or millets that you mm. should consider for this particular season. And we know you normally plant around 15 October. So maybe this year, consider maybe, you know, earlier around 21 September, take advantage of the, the late spring rainfall and so forth. 
So you need to bring it down to that level of detail so that for your mother sitting in Kwai, uh, growing sorghum, millets, uh, and some bambara ground nuts in Lubu, she knows that this yeah. year I need this variety of sorghum, I need this variety of millets, and these are the planting dates that I need to be looking at. So that is where we need help. And that is where you know partnerships with the public and private sector become critically important mm -hmm. in ensuring that we disseminate at that level. The seed companies have to provide the information to support variety selection. We also need to work with them to bring the seeds close to where the farmers are. So there are many things that we, we effectively still need to do and improve. Uh, and that is in the space of now what we call building effective response capabilities. So we've done well with the modeling and forecasting of El Nino. We've, we've done well in terms of understanding the history of El Nino, how it has affected people and how it may affect people again and where the most vulnerable people are. We've done well in that regard. We've done well a little bit in terms of disseminating and making you know, noise and building awareness. We've not done extremely well in contextualizing Lighting, the message yeah. and getting it to the right resolution for the farmer. We've not also done well in terms of building the capacity at the farmer level to then be able to use this information, action it appropriately and mitigate the risk, which is why every time we have this situation, we almost always find that farmers are going to experience crop failure or yield losses or penalties. The region as a whole faces the risk of hunger, food prices then go up, and it takes us a couple of years to recover from that. So the response capability is, is where we need to, to really work uh, very hard at. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Tafazo, and I think that's uh, that's a good way of putting it, that uh, our response capability needs a lot of work. Um, I do have a question around uh, from one of the members of the audience who, who I think raises an important issue to say, for most farmers, yeah, the most reliable source of information, never mind Isaiah sending us um, interactive voice recordings, SMSs, uh, or, or chatbot uh, messages via WhatsApp or Telegram, their most reliable source of agricultural information is the local extension officer. And, and, and my question to you, Tafadza, is what could we do, you know, from a, a policy and procedure perspective to ensure that these agro-advisories that you and I are talking about uh, are actually used in the daily operations of the National Agricultural Extension Systems? Because at the end of the day, no matter how ineffective we might think they might be, they are still the most reliable source of information for farmers. What can we do to make sure that that uh, um, domain or, or chef, the producer or the lead farmer who is interacting with farmers wherever they are in Southern or Eastern Africa is got the right kind of um, of information on a regular basis. Are we not bypassing the national systems and going to the fancy technologies Isaiah is talking about? Uh, I think our model has always been designed to work to support national systems, uh, not to replace or supersede national systems. Uh, but what we also have to recognize is that the capacity of national systems varies hugely. Uh, across Africa. In, in many places, the national extension services have very much disintegrated. In some areas, you've got more private sector extension services. Uh, and where we still have national extension services available, uh, years of underfunding have also limited and curtailed their capacity. You look at when I was growing up, let's say in Zimbabwe, uh, you know, the, them do many all had, you know, motorbikes. You, they were visible in the rural areas. They would be seen everywhere. Uh, but years of, you know, funding constraints and so forth have meant that they are no longer as mobile as, as they could have been, which is where then the digital technologies come in to plug yeah. some of these gaps where, you know, we've, we've lost that capacity. 
uh, even, you know, people are doing radio talk shows. We know farmers in rural areas listen to the radio uh, and trust what they hear on the radio. We've got radio talk shows that are happening. So innovating uh, is, is important to bridge the gap between the extension and the farmer. Coming back to the extension themselves, there is need for capacity development. Because like I said, in, in many countries, the advisory has been issued at a national level. level it yeah. has not then been cascaded down to a district and ward level where the extension officer sitting at a ward level has that similar advisory, but specific for his ward. Oh, for their say, area. Yeah. For their area that they can call a meeting with farmers and say, you know, listen, this is the information that has come through. We haven't gotten it there. We've done it at the national yeah. level. We need to disaggregate it down to the ward level. And we need to build the capacity of the extension officers exactly. to be able to interpret that information further so that they can explain it to farmers and advise farmers properly and effectively on what needs to be done. Brilliant. Isaiah, quickly, uh, uh, do you see an opportunity here uh, for your, you called it farmer business school, Should it, shouldn't it also include uh, extension uh, business school so that the content that Tafazo is talking about, we are also getting it to the extension workers because often they are, they are resident in the same communities where the farmers are, they are subject to the same internet challenges. And yet, because they've got that little bit extra level of uh, technical agricultural knowledge, they will be able to help us with the contextualization. How could your technology, for example, at BIM City contribute uh, to, to raising the levels of knowledge of extension officers as well? Yeah, thanks, Mandela. And, and, um, so of course, I agree with you. We can bypass the intention, um, I mean, extension, um, 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 uh, the guys in the community basically come to use um, our own technology. So in the sense that they have more of empathy or emotional attachment to the farmers. So the farmers can easily trust whatever guidance or teaching is coming from them. So bypassing them, we'll be doing, we will be doing disservice to the impact of whatever we're trying to pass into that community. And that also, we need them for feedback, right? So yeah. what we've decided to do, because feedback is very, very critical. So one, one of the things that we, we have decided to incorporate into the technology of Dream City right now, for example, is to say, as a farmer, you should be able to connect to your community leader or whoever is the extension worker that is in that particular community. So the information doesn't have, have to necessarily go all the way back to the national um, system because they, there's going to be a lag there. Is either that yeah. um, communication or that um, inquiry from that particular farmer in that particular community get lost in the transit, or basically yeah. we're not able to get so. But if the information or the 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 inquiry from that particular farmer goes to his community leader, then he's able to get a feedback on time. So we try to create Brilliant. this what we call the pull and push uh, mm -hmm. um, um, framework. So the pool basically is. Um, as a farmer, I should be able to dial into the system and speak voice, right? Because it, once again, we believe that these farmers, they can't write, right? So they should be able to speak in their local dialect and the system pushes that information, that void note from the farmer to the, um, to the, to the community leader or um, extension worker, as we may call, we may call yeah. them. And the community uh, leader is able to push back the same voice note to the farmer. So that way, we're having a two-way communication between these two right. critical players. And now in terms of the institution worker or um, the community leader, he has access to the faculty. If he needs to get more information, because um, let's say a particular um, community leader who is in a location where we have only 2G network or 3G, right? Cannot go and solve the internet, right? So he should be able to dial into his own faculty as a right. social worker and use um, voice or audio or USSD to get to pull the information, the content the right that information, he needs, yeah. the content that yeah. he needs, and pass it down to the farmers. So we've come Brilliant. to realize that they are they are very very critical uh, part of this process. We can bypass them. So that has been incorporated. So lastly, I would say what we've the next thing we've incorporated into this using the pull and push technology or mechanism is to say this particular voice platform or the USSD platform should be the Google for the farmer. 
right? right? So you and I, whatever information we need, we should be able to go online and type and we have multiple suggestions that come our way. So the same way we have used voice to enable the farmers, they can dial in and get this information delivered right back from them, from the community. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, uh, Amos, uh, that was your question. I think it's been uh, effectively uh, answered. Uh, there are a couple of questions. One is from Tepo, uh, Tepo Mutamai, who's, who's asking this uh, issue around Tafadzwa. You know, the season is starting and we're saying farmers maybe need to look at other varieties, but uh, there are dietary issues, right, uh, yeah. associated with the acceptance of these varieties. Is there anything that we can, uh, we can do to make sure that ahead of time, yes, we're not, uh, you know, uh, recommending drought tolerant varieties, but the Nshima or the pap or the sat associated with them is, is not what people enjoy. Uh, do you have a quick answer to that before we jump on to Jonathan's uh, question? Yes, correct. I think in many instances, we have now been able to combine uh, advisory on crop or variety selection with nutrient dense crops uh -huh. oh, uh, because right. we do realize that in areas or hotspots uh, where farmers are vulnerable to things such as El Nino or weather extremes, those are also food and nutrition insecurity hotspots. So when we recommend variety selection, we are also looking at crops that offer, uh, you know, or that are nutrient dense. That's when I was also talking about the need to diversify uh, by multi-cropping uh, you know, incorporating things such as legumes, uh, leafy vegetables, because there's a dietary aspect that is also, and that is always under consideration when providing agro advisory. Brilliant, brilliant. There's a very technical question from uh, uh, Nurusen Said Yesup. Uh, Nurusen is asking a question around. Okay, so so is it possible for for you know yourselves as a science community to provide you know, this gridded climate data uh, with the advisory focus uh, for people who are involved in the, in the extension space to, 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 to respond. That's a very technical one for you, uh, uh, Tafadzwa. Is it possible to get this gridded uh, climate data uh, with, the, with the relevant advisories or is this something we are still working on? It's, it's possible uh, and at, at a gridded level, it's actually easier. To, yeah. to provide it at a gridded level uh, because grids are, are actually quite huge. What is harder is yeah. providing it at, at a more localized level like village or, or what. Right. What right. is lacking right. uh, is partnership between national meteorological organizations yeah. uh, and you know academia, the private sector, our seed companies and so forth then be able to translate this information into usable and relevant oh, formats yes. that can exactly. then be done. It's not a lack of information at appropriate scales because we've got very good downscaling techniques to downscale the information. It's just the relevant partnerships that then, yeah. you know, it's a value chain that has to be there to then move from the information through to knowledge products and through to actions and then ensuring that, you know, at the action level, there is effective uh, response capabilities for people to be able to then act at the end of the day. Brilliant. So I think we could talk for the whole day about this. Nurusen, I hope your question has been answered by Tafadzwa. Please reach out to Tafadzwa after, after this webinar. You will be able to get the graded content. But like he's saying, we then need to curate that and make sure that it's, it's packaged together with the relevant information, which answers the so what question. But I think uh, as we wrap up, I, I would like to, to, to invite my colleague, uh, Barbara, to come back on, uh, because as the Excellence in Agronomy Initiative, uh, our mandate is to really help to assemble uh, the best agronomy science, uh, form partnerships with the public, private, and uh, the civil society sector, to find ways of getting this uh, uh, agronomic uh, advisory content into the hands of farmers, as many of them as possible. So for the El Nino challenge specifically, uh, we have uh, recently launched what we are calling the Grow Smart uh, campaign. And the Grow Smart campaign is, uh, 
is a very focused set of very um, well thought out messages, uh, which we are putting out there, which are helping farmers to, to understand a little bit better about how to respond. Grow smart is an acronym. Actually, I thought uh, it's very is very smart, and we're going to watch a quick video that describes what Grow Smart is all about. Uh, let's give it a second. Barbara, you can restart it. We can't hear the audio, by the way. So maybe restart it. Hi, can you hear me? I was on mute, sorry. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. Okay, so okay. maybe you can start. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Barbara Muzata, and I'm with the Excellence in Agronomy Initiative. I'm excited, very excited to be bringing to you Grow Smart a campaign that has been designed to help farmers navigate the challenges faced by uh, weather patterns caused by El Nino. We all know that farmers have many questions they ask during this period, right? And we sat down with our partners and collaborators and thought, why not give them an advisory or a support tool that can help them get the information they need to manage these challenges through this time? So we're bringing this to you. We're launching it officially today, but we're saying to our partners as well, take this challenge, become a Grow Smart champion, come with us and share information with your farmers as well. And to make sure that our collaborators come on board, we're going to nominate some of them on this video today, asking them to be a part of this campaign, and to our fellow partners, to our fellow industry colleagues, when you've been nominated, please take this challenge, take up this challenge and spread the information, make the circle bigger. So my nominee today is Ruramiso Mashumba. Ruramiso, I know you work with farmers across Africa and my ask is take the information that you packaged, share it with your farmers and join the challenge. Join the Global Agronomy Village as we strive to make life better for farmers during this season. Thank, so, thank, thanks a lot, Barbara. And as you can see on the screen there, we've got uh, the Gross Mud acronym. It stands for Get the Right Varieties, Retain Soil Moisture, uh, use optimal planting times, manage your soil your soil well, make sure you are suppress, suppressing weeds, maximize the use of manure and fertilizers, but apply them wisely, reduce your risk by, by diversifying crops, and of course, use timely planting. Now to access the full suite of information associated with GrowSmart, you can scan the QR code that is on your screen right now. And that will take you into a toolkit that has various sets of, uh, of content and information that you can use to then uh, contextualize these messages and make sure that they are getting to as many farmers as possible. Isaiah mentioned an important point and the issue of a feedback loop. We want to hear back from you. How are farmers responding? How are farmers ready? How are farmers prepared? to take and use this advisory that we are sharing with you and what are the results? Are farmers experiencing better outcomes as a result of this advisory? So please reach out to our communications team and share as much information as you can about what's happening in your areas as farmers start to grow smart and respond to El Nino. It is a challenge, but El Nino can be managed we can beat El Nino and this season need not be like other El Nino years as we use the information that's available, get it to the people that need them and make sure that we are moving forward with much more wisdom and start to grow smart. So I would like to thank my panelists, uh, uh, Professor Tapadza Mabaudi, uh, my brother, Dr. Isaiah Bendi, uh, and all of you who have uh, taken time uh, to listen to us uh, the request is very simple. Let's all become cross mud champions. Let's make sure that farmers this year are not victims of El Nino, but are victors over the El Nino uh, crisis. Thank you so much for your time. It's already top of the hour, and uh, I'm happy to hand over to my colleague, Barbara Mzata. Thank you so much.
Um, thank you for that, Mandla. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining our call today and staying on. We will be sharing some of the materials you've seen shared today um, on email. And we ask you to please get in touch. Um, let's work together. Let's collaborate and share information with, with farmers and help them to get the information they need during this period. Um, I see some questions as well that have not been answered. We will share a certificate um, at the issue. I see your question. Um, and to any other question that has not been asked or answered, we will answer. If you haven't had an opportunity to ask, please get in touch with us on, on email and we will make sure that we, we attend to any queries that you may have.